Chapter 18. New Hampshire, live free or die. On May 23, 1796, the Philadelphia Gazette published an advertisement. The next day, a second Philadelphia newspaper, Claypool's American Daily Advertiser, published the same ad. $10 reward, the headline exclaimed, and it was followed by a description of Ona Judge. Absconded from the household of the President of the United States. On Saturday afternoon, Ona Judge, a light mulatto girl, much freckled, with very black eyes and bushy black hair. She is of middle stature, but slender and delicately made, about 20 years of age. She has many changes of very good clothes of all sorts, but they are not sufficiently recollected to describe. As there was no suspicion of her going off, and it happened without the least provocation, it is not easy to conjecture whether she's gone, or fully, what her design is. But as she may attempt to escape by water, all masters of vessels and other are cautioned against receiving her on board, although she may and probably will endeavor to pass for a free woman, and it is said has wherewithal to pay her passage. Ten dollars will be paid to any person, white or black, who will bring her home, if taken in the city or on board any vessel inside the harbor, and a further reasonable sum if apprehended and brought home, from a greater distance and in proportion to the distance. May 24th, Kit Stewart. Descriptions of runaway slaves ran in newspapers all the time. But this advertisement was shocking because it announced that an enslaved woman had absconded from the President of the United States. No one knows exactly when Martha or George realized Ona was missing. It probably was the night she left or even the next morning. Had Martha been waiting for Ona to brush her hair? Had George been expecting Ona to carry Martha's bag down the stairs? Ona, we can hear them call. Ona, where are you? No answer. Martha may not have worried until a few minutes turned into 10, 20. Could she? Would she? How dare she? Forget about the impoliteness of now not having a gift for Eliza. Now Martha felt as if Ona Judge had humiliated her in public. George must have had to listen to Martha's cries about Ona's ingratitude. The girl was brought up and treated more like a child than a servant, he later wrote. By the time they'd calmed down and devised a plan, Ona had a big head start. By now she would have learned that she was on her way to a state way up in the north, Tobias Lear's home state, New Hampshire. Ona may have remembered this, just as she may have remembered that she had met a member of probably the most respected family in New Hampshire, Senator John Langdon. Ona would have certainly remembered Senator Langdon's daughter, Elizabeth, who was the same age as Nellie, Martha's granddaughter, and whom Ona might have visited and watched when the Langdon family had visited Philadelphia. Like the rest of the northern states, New Hampshire was moving fitfully towards abolition. On the plus side, the state's Bill of Rights specified that every citizen of New Hampshire was promised equality and liberty. On the minus side, slavery had been legal since the colony had first been established in 1641. In the 1780s, when Ona had first moved north, New Hampshire had finally begun to make progress towards outlawing slavery. But it wasn't until 1857 that the state outlawed slavery altogether. Luckily for Ona, she was arriving in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a town that would declare itself free from slavery in 1805, 52 years earlier than the state itself. When the Nancy tied up against the wooden dock, Ona would have probably left the ship as quickly as she could, her eyes scanning the strangers to see if anyone sparked any kind of recognition. Her first priority was to find a place to live, no easy task for a single black woman with very little money. But the network of free black allies had worked. People were expecting her. Someone, we don't know who, met her at the dock. She was soon directed to her temporary home with a free black family. Philadelphia and Portsmouth had two things in common. They both had prominent shipyards, and they were both ahead of the curve with respect to slavery. Other than that, they were vastly different. Portsmouth was tiny, with only about 5,000 residents, and there were fewer black people in the entire city of Portsmouth than there were slaves living in Mount Vernon. The only benefit to this was that Ona would soon grow to know the majority of the black community. But she didn't have time yet to meet people. Her priority was to get a job. She had been sewing all her life and had designed and stitched together some of Martha's beautiful gowns. In today's world, she might have been a fashion designer. Without letters of recommendation vouching for her actual expertise, Ona had to tell potential employers that she was fit for all kinds of domestic work. Ona was smart, quick-witted, and nimble, but she was not prepared for all kinds of work. She had to learn fast. Besides doing laundry and house cleaning, Ona would have had to pick up cooking skills. Perhaps in a household other than the Washingtons, Ona would have learned how to cook, but with Hercules around, an early American celebrity chef, she had stayed away from the kitchen. So cooking was something she would have had to learn on the fly. All households needed someone who knew how to prepare the basic meals for a family. Further, in Portsmouth, a domestic servant was expected to do all domestic work, like carry heavy cauldrons of water, sew dresses, and make dinner. Once again, it appears that Ona's black allies in Portsmouth stepped in. 
They likely spent time teaching her what she would have to do. Then they got her a job. Two facts stand out. One, the majority of black women in New England at the time did not live beyond the age of 40. And two, the majority of black women in New England were employed as domestic workers. There was a connection between the two. The domestic work was nonstop and grueling, but Ona got paid. From the outside, if you didn't know her past, you would think she was just a free black woman working hard to get a small but appreciated and deserved salary. It would be fair to assume that she was overworked and underpaid, which she certainly was. But it would also be fair to assume that all the work and all the pay was worth it to Ona because of the basic fact that she was living the way she, not Martha, not George, chose to live. She was still scared. She knew that the Washingtons would soon be on her trail. So Ona, as she always did, kept quiet and listened. Portsmouth was not perfect and neither was New Hampshire, but people like John Bowles and her new free black friends had convinced her that her relocation to Portsmouth was strategic and potentially rewarding. She never stopped looking over her shoulder for slave catchers, but for the first time since she had heard that she would be given away as a wedding gift, she let herself take a deep breath and hope. <laughs>